Secret organizations are often surrounded by mystery and conspiracies. Mardi Gras crews are no different, and in the 187 years since New Orleanians started parading, several controversies have swelled. Unsurprisingly, the exclusivity of the clubs and their explicit exclusion of certain types of people are at the center of most of the controversy. But let's start with the basics. Eating king cake out of season. More than a faux pas, some will tell you that eating this confectionery treat outside of carnival time will earn curses for the city. King cake is the treat associated with the carnival season and only to be consumed between January 6th, the Epiphany, and Mardi Gras Day. Arthur Hardy describes the history of the king cake tradition in his book, Mardi Gras in New Orleans, an illustrated history. It began with an ancient custom of celebrating surviving the winter by making a crown-shaped cake with the wheat from the previous year. Hardy explains that Romans added the tradition of choosing a king and then the Catholic Church said mine in the fourth century. The custom came to New Orleans via Creoles. While the truth of the curse can be debated, there is no doubt that the scarcity created by this tradition is why king cakes are such a beloved sweet in New Orleans. Just like the formation of organizations like the Daughters of the Confederacy who erected huge statues of Confederate leaders decades after the Civil War were attempts to establish and maintain power through intimidation, it is no coincidence that the first organization of a Mardi Gras crew occurred right around the time of the Civil War and flourished during Reconstruction. Instead of egalitarian street parades with everyone flooding the street together, all masked and hidden from judgment for the day, the parades of secret crews became elevated above the crowd, carried by elaborate floats, literally reigning above their subjects. The formalities of giving Rex the city for the day furthers the facade. The ban on allowing sponsors ensures that the crews themselves foot the bill, at least publicly, and shower the plebeians with their gifts. All aspects of the illusion are meant to establish and maintain power just as the hereditary royalty of Europe used pageantry and parade to maintain their power, explained Rosary O'Neill in her book, New Orleans Carnival Cruise, The History, Spirit, and Secrets of Mardi Gras. Mardi Gras has been canceled a few times in history, mostly coinciding with wars. The most recent cancellation was in 2021 during the pandemic. The first official cancellation was from 1862 to 1865 during the Civil War. Then it was canceled again a decade later because of political conditions during Reconstruction. In 1875, the same year the governor vetoed an attempt to take away the legal holiday status of Mardi Gras, the parades once again did not roll. Governor Kellogg was one of two declared winners of the 1874 governor's election. The opposition staged a revolt called the Battle of Canal Street, the Battle of the White League, or the Battle of Liberty Place. All of those capable in the Old Line Carnival crews participated in the revolt, according to O'Neill. Indeed, we may draw a direct line from the KKK, which did not allow Catholics to the establishment of carnival crews in New Orleans, who were initially mainly Catholic. O'Neill writes, quote, While the Klan became increasingly violent, the carnival societies grew increasingly decorative and social, much like beauty pageants, to woo the world into a fantasy hierarchy. Unquote. Much like religious conservatives like to hoist signs about hell above Bourbon Street crowds, the KKK was never anti-Catholic enough to avoid masking for Mardi Gras when they were allowed. They decided to have queens to match the kings in 1884, but the queens were not secret. The first queens of Comus were the daughters of Robert E. Lee and several other prominent Confederates, a clear statement on the feelings of the powerful but secret members of the Mardi Gras cruise. In 1916, the Zulu Social Aid and Pleasure Club formally organized for the first time as a clear critique of the power and royalty of the old line Mardi Gras cruise. Zulu was seen as mocking the traditional Mardi Gras royalty from the beginning. Similarly, the crew of Virgilians organized in the 1930s and lasted until 1964. The members were Italian New Orleanians who were not yet allowed in the old line crews. The restriction have been eased on nationalities like Italian, Irish, and German, but Jewish people and African Americans are still not often considered for membership in the old line crews. 
O'Neill explains in her book that these old societies care more about your ancestry than any personal accomplishments. She also explains that the old line crews look down on the new super crews who seem to allow anyone who can pay to join. They consider it a society that you can buy your way into, while the old line crews are nearly impossible to join if you're not born into it. Another possible inadvertent nod to the hereditary royalty of Europe. I hope we've learned from the mistakes of the Habsburgs. In 1946, Mardi Gras faced a strike on the men who carry the flambeau. This was the first year returning after hiatus during World War II. The parades were delayed and many of the flambeau did not march, but Mardi Gras rolled on. 1961 saw an attempt to boycott the Zulu parade by leaders in the black community, claiming that the tradition was degrading to the race. While the chosen king that year did step down, the parade rolled as scheduled. To this day, controversy remains around the masking traditions of the Zulu Social Aid and Pleasure Club. A quiet contingent periodically attempts to remind the masses that blackface is not acceptable anywhere else. The historic society, however, maintains that their tradition, using makeup instead of masks, stems from the origins of the parade, when masking was not allowed for people of color. In 1979, a police strike to join the Teamsters Union instead of the police union led to the cancellation of several parades. Striking policemen defied court orders and state troopers came to substitute. The police initially declared a victory in the strike using Mardi Gras as a strategic strike time. But in the end, the mayor successfully prevented them from joining the Teamsters Union. In 1988, the so-called Coconut Bill exempted carnival societies from, quote, liability claims resulting from inadvertent coconut-caused injuries, unquote allowing the crews to shower the crowds with their precious throws without worry. In 1991, City Council person Dorothy May Taylor launched a campaign to rid Mardi Gras societies of their racist roots and change the face of Mardi Gras as we know it. This campaign is the reason that Rex is the only 19th century carnival society that still parades. Rather than integrate an open membership to other groups of people, many of the crews decided to close ranks and stop parading entirely. In 2020, the Black Lives Matter protests kicked off yet another controversy regarding race and Mardi Gras. The captain of the Mystic Crew of Nix, a former law enforcement professional, posted an All Lives Matter meme in response to the Black Lives Matter protests. At the time, Nix was one of the largest super crews that existed, and it was comprised of an extremely diverse membership, many of whom objected to their organization projecting that message. The controversy erupted into claims of irresponsible management of the club's money, including stealing tips designated for the float drivers. In the end, the membership of Nix splintered. The new crews they created in the wake were intentional in their goal of diversity among their membership. Rumors that Nix has paraded with their husbands in wigs to ensure they meet the minimum rider count for parade permits persist as the membership and attendees at the parade both dwindle. According to Hardy, Rex helped turn Mardi Gras into a tourist attraction, and the city pays more attention to what is good for tourists and the actual citizens of the city as a result. O'Neill agrees with this sentiment, writing, quote, The economists warn that dependence on tourist purse strings diverts public administrators and politicians' attention away from developing strategies and solutions to growing the economy in ways that resolve the city's many social problems, unquote. As a current citizen, even my fellow citizens seem to kowtow to the needs of tourists over our own needs with short-sighted visions of temporarily overflowing pockets after a festival. The thing that New Orleans may be most well known for, Mardi Gras, the thing that makes us exceptional to the world, is also the thing that makes us most American. In the coming videos, I'll talk about why it matters that New Orleans is truly American and not some magical foreign place where the rest of the country leaves their worries.